Um, looking back now, it's awful, and it should be fucking deleted, and all of us should be burned at the stake for it. We lost all of it. I was so mad. It was my time to shine. It, it all got cut. As soon as it ended, the people behind us just immediately started talking trash, like, what were these guys thinking? Why'd they waste money getting into this? I guess if you want a teenage Mexican girl to sleep over at your house, just post something on Craigslist saying you're looking for actors, and you'll get one right away. I don't care who's there, as long as it's money. I'm gonna get a penis in my vagina and then get money, and I don't care. The year was 2015. It had been two years since I graduated from high school, and my hobby of making short films had come to a grinding halt. To be fair, I had a lot of excuses for why I hadn't made many videos since the end of high school. For one, I moved away to college where I struggled to make any friends. And it wasn't for lack of trying. I also developed severe cystic acne that was so terrible I was horrified to ever appear on film or in pictures, which is a huge problem when 90% of the time I'm the star of my own movies. The horrible acne is actually the reason Monkey Jones exists in the first place. I wanted to wear a mask to cover my disgusting face, and I just so happened to have a monkey mask that I'd stolen from Biggs's younger brother. And thus, Monkey Jones was born. Another reason why my video production had slowed down was because I spent my free time in college working on my book, The Triflers, so at least I was grinding away at some sort of creative outlet. This isn't to say I never made videos during my first two years of college. There were a few minor projects, like when my friend Frid asked me to direct and edit his high school marketing project, and I intentionally sabotaged the project to make it as funny as possible. Suffice to say, Frit and I's friendship didn't last much longer after that. Haha, <laughs> boy, I sure do hope somebody got fired for that blunder. At the time, I was also producing a Let's Play channel called The Monkey and Big Show, where we uploaded two Let's Plays every single day for over a year. And on average, they got six views each. Hey, yeah. I need those carrots. No fucking- <laughs> Oh. Shit! No! <laughs> How's it offensive to talk about somebody? God! <laughs> They're just eating all day. They're like bigs. Depressed and hungry. <laughs> Jump! No! <laughs> Fuck! Wait, what? Dude, just because Fuck! he's fat. Fuck! Fuck! <laughs> Fuck! Okay, 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 we need to figure this out. Oh, God. There we go. <laughs> Give me those fucking carrots. <laughs> But god damn it, the fact that anyone was watching at all was enough to keep us going. At least until I made a random anime review that went viral, and then the sudden attention created too much pressure in our relationship, leading Biggs to delete the entire channel outright. Haha, <laughs> boy, I sure do hope somebody got fired for that blunder. But now, it was the summer of 2015, and me and all my high school friends were back home with nothing to do. And that's when I came across something called the 48 Hour Film Contest. The 48 Hour Film Contest is very different from the film contests I entered in high school. For starters, obviously, you only get 48 hours to produce your movie. And that's what makes the competition so much fun. In high school, we had months to produce those movies. And even with all that time to write, 
film, edit, and do reshoots, $5 was still a big piece of shit. But now, we would have to do all of that in only two days. To make matters more complex, there are specific elements you must include in your film in order to make sure nobody cheats and submits a film they already produced. Before the 48 hour period begins, all the filmmakers entering the competition meet together at a kickoff event and each group is randomly given a specific genre that their film must be. The genres include things like comedy, musical, western, horror, drama, and unfortunately, Film Day Femme, aka a feminist film. And if you've seen the title of this video, well, you know where this is going. On top of the genre, there are also a few required elements that all films must share. Specifically, they give us a character name, a prop, and a line of dialogue that must be included somewhere in the film. This is actually what inspired me to do the same thing for the Mumkey short film contest we do here on YouTube, where I require everyone to include a line of dialogue and a character name. After doing a bit of research on the 48 hour film contest, I thought it would be the perfect excuse for all my old high school friends and I to reunite and make a short film just like the good old days. So I gathered them all together and we agreed to enter the contest. I paid the $150 entry fee, and we were basically ready to go. Except, there was one problem. It was a complete sausage fest. We had literally no girls. And given the fact that some of the possible genres included things like romance and film day femme, I figured it would be useful to get a girl involved in the project. So. I went on Craigslist and made a post explaining that we were a 48 hour film contest group seeking an actress to join our team. And we got a response back from an 18 year old aspiring actress. Now I know what you're thinking. But Monkey, you've gotta be making this shit up. There's no fucking way in hell that a random 18 year old girl from Craigslist who none of you had ever met before agreed to come stay in a house with a bunch of loud, ugly, autistic men in their early 20s for a 48 hour period. Well, it happened. It sure did fucking happen. And this would soon prove to be the most important piece of preparation we did. Because at the kickoff event, we were horrified to be given the genre of film de femme. Through a horrible twist of fate, this random girl from Craigslist we'd never met before now had to be the star of our film. But you don't just have to take my word for it. In the first two videos in this series, I've been the one doing all the reflecting and narrating about the films I made. So, I figured it'd be fun and interesting to interview the other people involved in the production. Which is why I've spent the last two weeks traveling all over the country, from North Carolina to Georgia to Iowa to Chicago, to interview some of the guys who were involved in the project. I'm Biggs Bigsington, also known as Trash King in the film we're talking about. I go by Pink. My name is Dakota. I played Dr. Myers in One Man's Trash. <laughs> Shut up. Hi, my name's Patsy Jones. <laughs> my name's Cobb and I played Rat. And it's safe to say I wasn't the only one in the group horrified that I just spent $150 to enter a short film contest only to be forced to make a feminist film. I was not happy at all. I had some ideas for every other genre except for film de femme. So it was like the worst thing that could happen. I was like, what the fuck is film de femme? Like, I literally did not know what the hell that was. And then when you told me that it was the lead female, I'm like, but we have no chicks. We, we know no ladies to do this. What fucking females do we know? Because we don't have any female friends, so we're screwed. The video's over. There's nothing. So what was your reaction when you found out we 
we're going to be making a feminist film for our 48 hour film. Uh, I didn't know what to think. Uh, so to be honest, this is news to me that it was a feminist film. You still did? You didn't yeah. know this whole time? No. <laughs> <laughs> but the show had to go on. The timer started and we now had a 48 hour period to figure out what the fuck we were gonna do, film it, edit it, and hand it in. And as the director of the film, the pressure was on me to make sure everything went smoothly. So I created a schedule. The contest began Friday at 7 p.m. and our film was due Sunday at 7 p.m. So Friday night was prep time. Once we got back to my house, we would work together to form the concept and write the script. Once the script was ready, the group would go to Walmart to purchase supplies, costumes, props, snacks, and even random shit that we didn't know what to do with, but decided to buy anyway since Cobb agreed to front the bill. So I, I had the, uh, the mindset that this would actually turn out pretty good. Um... When we went shopping for all the supplies, I was like, oh yeah, this is going to be great. You know, we're, we're investing time and money into this. Um, when I finally saw the final product, I, I was proud of all of us for the, the time and everything, the, the effort we put into it. Um, looking back now, it's awful and it should be fucking deleted and all of us should be burned at the stake for it. <laughs> <laughs> It was fun. I, I remember not being there when you guys went shopping because it was my girlfriend's at the time's birthday. So I just gave you guys my card and said, oh. here, spend like top to 150. And then you guys, I come back later that night or whatever. And there's just a shit ton of shit. I'm just like, we can incorporate this all. You wasted all my money. And somehow we did. I was like, what the fuck's this pizza paid for? Yeah. I think Walmart's definitely like the funnest part because we're just running around throwing stuff in the cart watching Cobb's face just cringe as he sees dollar signs <laughs> increase in the cart. But wait a second. Cobb said he wasn't there when we went shopping. But Biggs claims he was. Who is lying? Who is telling the truth? Vote at the straw poll link down in the description. The film Mad Max Fury Road had been released earlier that summer. And given that we were stuck making a feminist film with one girl and a bunch of ugly guys, we figured we'd try our best to do a shitty, no-budget version of that movie. The idea was that we'd make a post-apocalypse film about a small group led by a woman trying to travel through a dangerous territory owned by freaks who worship garbage. It would be simple to do since I lived in the middle of nowhere. And for costuming, we would just need to tear up our clothes and tape garbage to ourselves. I decided having another girl join the team to play one of the protagonists would be helpful, so I called my younger cousin who had zero acting experience. By the end of Friday night, the script was ready, the cast was collected, our props and costumes had been purchased, and all that was left to do was wait for sunrise to begin filming. And with all that being said, the stage has been set for what potentially could have been a decently entertaining Mad Max ripoff. Little did we know, we were about to spend a full day in the fiery Iowa summer heat, working our asses off to produce an absolute embarrassment. So, without further ado, let's take a look at One Man's Trash. This should stop the bleeding. Let's try to keep some pressure on it. Those guys just came out of nowhere. We should just go around. If we go around this territory, we'll take an extra three days at least. We just need to hustle through and hope we don't run into any more of those freaks. Oh, look over there, Whiskers. They're right out in the open. Don't they look delicious? Maybe if we share them with the trash king, he will reward us most generously. Don't come a step closer, you freak! Oh man, where to even begin? I'm just gonna frame the entire discussion of the film like this. 
The scenes that focus on the heroes are completely awful. The scenes that focus on the villains are somewhat entertaining. Now, since I was the director of the project, the blame for that is gonna fall on me. Everyone involved is obviously an amateur actor. And I can't really fault them for that because I assume they were doing their best. But there are a lot of issues that I can take credit for. For example, we decided early on that the character being played by my cousin would have a leg injury. And that would explain why the group needs to travel as fast as possible through the dangerous territory rather than wasting time by going around. However, I also decided that whenever the group is walking, the two healthy characters would be used as crutches for the injured one. And that led to a lot of awkward movement and loud stomping that made important initial dialogue almost impossible to understand. I think we're at a safe distance now. Let's find a place to rest up. Um, so I'm naturally tall and... <laughs> The, uh, we have a female protagonist who happens to be injured, so being hunched over for eight hours during that fucking day, acting like I'm carrying her, put a strain on my back. That was bullshit. Also, you might notice in the scene when the doctor is wrapping up her leg, the medical tape was already covered in blood, which is fucking retarded. Haha, <laughs> boy, I sure do hope somebody got fired for that blunder. Don't come a step closer, you freak! We... we mean no harm to you. Rats and whiskers only wish to help. Get the hell away from us right now! Hold on, Scout. Maybe he can help us. I think the main reason why the villains are more interesting than the heroes in this film is because we spent a lot of time having fun developing the characters to have their own stupid little personalities. For example, Cobb's character is named Rat and has a toy mouse named Whiskers taped to his shoulder who he talks to as if it's alive. That's inherently more entertaining to watch on screen than anything we've seen from the three protagonists thus far. And that brings us to what I like to call the burden of the straight man. And no, I don't mean the sexual orientation, although I think we can all agree that straight white men have the greatest burden of all in American society. When you're developing something about crazy, wacky characters, you also want to include a straight man, aka a perfectly normal, average person, because the juxtaposition of the straight man to the crazy characters will help articulate and highlight their wackier characteristics. The problem that can arise is when you spend too much time developing the wacky fun characters and the straight man characters become completely boring and uninteresting by comparison. Which is especially bad when half your movie focuses on the straight man characters. We definitely should have spent an equal amount of time giving all of the characters interesting attributes while still staying true to the straight man funny man dynamic. <sighs> And next up, we have the biggest blunder of the entire film. And yes, I sure do hope somebody got fired for it. Let's see if you notice it without me pointing it out. Get the hell away from us right now. Hold on, Scout. Maybe he can help us. I work for the Trash King. He owns all of this land. He can grant you permission to travel here. Just follow me. Come on. Come on. Let's go. <sighs> yeah. At about 2 a.m. while we were editing the film, we were horrified to discover this scene was missing the audio. I was so, like, pissed, and I was like, you're just fucking with us. Like, you're just like, this video went so smooth, pretty much, like, filming-wise. I'm just like, he's just fucking with us. Then we go in there and watch it, and it's just like, what the fuck? Fuck Coda. The other Coda who fucking was running the boom mic and not hooking it up, like, he a bitch. You and I were actually in your room at the time, editing it, like, piece by piece. And when we got to that scene, one of our friends had been filming at the, well, holding the boom mic at the time. And when we started clicking play, we were checking the volume on the computer and stuff, and just slowly realized that he never turned it on. <laughs> So we were just like immediately pissed. I remember being super mad and just like, I think one of us even was about to call him, but it was so late. We just like 
Well, we, we had no choice but to voice over, so I mean, we had to make do. It was so late and like we were exhausted. We were like, we can't film it, go out and refilm it. Cause everyone, I think Coda has had left and like, I don't, we didn't have everyone there anymore. And we were just like handcuffed and it was just like, well, we can try to like match up what we said exactly word for word, but it just didn't work and we just were like, no, it's too fucking late. We're just going to get the main bullet points because that was the big main part of the movie because that had the most plot build of it. We lost all of it. I was so mad. It was my time to shine. It, it all got cut. I'm not sure if most people noticed the horrible dub, and luckily I was able to edit in the sound effect of the group stomping around from a different clip, but man, does this scene stick out like a sore thumb now. There was so much important expository dialogue in this shot that was completely ruined. <laughs> Just fucking didn't exist. Next, we finally get to meet the rest of the trash goons with a glorious opening shot of Biggs literally bathing in a disgusting fucking swamp. And I'll say it again, I really enjoy all the scenes focused on these characters. He's the one in the swamp. Noble Trash King, I'm Scouter, and these are my companions, Rosalind and Dr. Myers. We are traveling from Bettendorf to Des Moines, and we wish to travel peacefully through your territory. <laughs> These purelings want to travel through the Trash King's home? They must be baddie! <laughs> <laughs> but your wretchedness, perhaps we could simply just eat them. Silence! There must be order in the Trash Kingdom. We cannot simply eat any purling that walks on our doorstep. Rat! Take them away quickly! Their cleanliness is disgusting! Yes, yes, your vileness! Come along, Pierlings! <laughs> From just a pure entertainment level, I really enjoy what we've got going on here. The costumes and makeup for the Trash Goons I think are excellent, the characters are wacky and wild, the Trash King has a bizarre sense of morality, there's an outlandish sense of humor with garbage and dirt being seen as virtuous and being clean or pure is regarded as a horrible sin. I wish this could have been the movie. But that fucking feminist film genre made us think we could Mad Max that shit. The next few scenes jump back and forth, both between groups of characters and between levels of entertainment value. So, let's eat all our vegetables so we can get back to dessert. Rosalind's wound isn't looking too good. If she keeps on that leg too much longer, she won't be able to walk. We'll be screwed if she becomes dead weight. Then we keep going, straight through the territory, and if those garbage freaks try to mess with us, and we'll tear them in half. Don't risk your lives for my sake. Just go around without me. Our mission is too important, and we all knew somebody wouldn't make it. We stay together. We need to keep our eyes peeled for the trash junkies. Rosalind, do you still have that necklace of yours? Yeah. How's that supposed to help? I guess now would be as good a time as any to discuss the 48-hour film contest requirements from that year. As you may recall, I explained that every film was required to use a character, prop, and line of dialogue somewhere in the film. The required character was a doctor named Harold Myers, which of course is Dakota. The required prop was a broom, which comes in the next scene. And the required line of dialogue was, how's that supposed to help, which the Rosalind character just said. Rosalind, do you still have that necklace of yours? Yeah. 
How's that supposed to help? We need to get moving. Are you two ready? Gather round, my dump dealers! It's feeding time! I have the need, the need to feed. A feast, a feast! Feed! <laughs> so this was essentially supposed to be the money shot of the film. It's no secret that we love making bigs do disgusting, embarrassing things for the sake of comedy. And this film was definitely no exception. It wasn't enough that we had him bathe in a swamp. We also wanted an extended shot of him eating cat food out of a can. Now here's where I fucked up. It's never really clear what he's eating. I never get a close-up shot of the label so that you know it's cat food, so for all the audience knows, he's eating tuna or something. When in reality, poor Biggs is scarfing down disgusting fucking wet cat food for no reason. Biggs. He gave a pretty good performance, I would say. I think consistently he always is the highlight of any of the movies he's in. Honestly, he puts himself through uh, degrading stuff for <laughs> everyone's amusement. He does so. that off camera too. <laughs> <laughs> One time we were driving back to your place after going to McDonald's, it was just me and him, and he said to me, hey watch this, and he ate his cheeseburger without taking off the wrapper. <laughs> That's not the first time. <laughs> He still could eat the wrapping. He would eat Starburst without unwrapping, then he would just pop them in his mouth. During the movie, <laughs> I was just like, what the fuck are you doing, man? Uh, well, what questions should I ask Biggs when I interview him for this movie? Uh, that's a good question. See, so you have a cat food taste. <laughs> and he's yeah. slowly eating some. Yeah, right. Uh, ask about the cat food. You also have a scene in the woods where you get to eat cat food. Do you remember? Where did that idea come from? Who came up with that? And what was your initial thoughts on the request that you eat cat food in the movie? Oh man, I, I'd i assume it was either you or I. We always come up with like the retarded stuff like that. But uh, when it was brought up, I was just all in. I was like, you know, if we're going to win this, got to make it as funny as possible. So yeah, and then uh, when it came time, I was just like, all right, this is it. And then I also had to eat uh, hand sanitizer, so <laughs> anything for film. Yeah, on that, I wanted to ask you, uh, throughout all the films that they've seen you in thus far, it seems we always make you do the most disgusting things, the most embarrassing things. You're, you're usually the butt of the joke, and I wanted to give you the chance to uh, talk about your maybe philosophy of uh, always putting up with this shit for the sake of film. Well, I mean, I always thought it was funny too. I'd laugh along with everyone else because, I mean, yeah, some of it was kind of cruel, but for film and looking back on it, like it was such, it's such priceless film to look back on because we always laugh every time we watch it. And then like, it's kind of, uh, I read Brian Cranston's book and he talked about going through Malcolm in the Middle and they did like, what won't Brian do? during that and I just kind of got some inspiration from that because it's like if they're gonna ask me to do something I'm just gonna do it <laughs> if I have been questioning just you know I mean it added a lot of humor to the film I feel so it was worth it
King. I just witnessed the purelings in your territory. The purelings? They ignored my heating. We offered peaceful resolution. Now it's time for war. Tonight, we dine our purling flesh. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we finally come to the dramatic action climax of the story, where the protagonists face off with the trash goons. And it's just embarrassing. On one level, it's kind of funny how big of pushovers the trash goons are. Just the visual of a tiny little girl defeating a huge, burly guy like Manimal in hand-to-hand -hand combat is funny to look at. But ultimately, the choreography of the fight scene is completely uninspired and could easily be made more interesting. I think the problem was the heat was getting to us and we were ready to get out of the sun. And during the script writing process, we just wrote, they fight, rather than planning out a fun battle sequence. So the entire thing feels completely phoned in. And that's because it was completely phoned in. Behind us! <laughs> My trash goons! My disgusting trash goons! You purelings will pay for this insolence! Doctor. You and I need to try our best to hold him down. Rosalind, use your necklace. Uh, my fill, my beautiful fill. Uh, the air on my exposed skin burns. You purelings have ruined me. You've ruined me! Ugh. Let us travel through unharmed, or else we'll clean the rest of you too. Oh, yes, yes, anything. Just don't tarnish my beautiful filth. Why does the Rosalind character have a hand sanitizer necklace? I don't fucking know. It's all so, so fucking stupid. During the creative process, we thought it would be funny to defeat the Trash King by cleaning him. And we needed to shoe in the line, how's that supposed to help? So our answer was that Rosalind had a hand sanitizer necklace. The more you think about it, the more horrible the whole thing is. And now that the conflict has been resolved and the trash goons are out of the film, we have one final painful scene of resolution. It should only be a day outside of Des Moines now. You think you're gonna make it? Yeah, I think I should be fine. Well, I expect smooth sailing once we reach Des Moines. Good. Our people are depending on us. What were your thoughts on the, the finished product when you finally got to see it? So at the time, I thought it was better than most of the stuff we had already done. Um, so for comparison, $5, <laughs> uh, this blew it way out of the water. It was better equipment, um, better, uh, acting. Um, I, I think we grew up and learned a lot of mistakes from the past. Um, uh, looking back at it now, it is still horrendous. Uh, probably a solid, like four out of 10 with all the technical errors and the cast of actors who don't know how to act. But if you remade it today and had more than 48 hours, you could probably make it at least like an 8 out of 10. It was... I'm going to piggyback off what Coda said. At the time, it was probably one of the best things we've had. Uh, today, it's cringeworthy. I'm sad. It, just like that scene with the voiceover, I always want to just bury my head in the pillow. I'm just like, why? <laughs> like, and then just 
fucking pigs eating the cat food. I'm just like, why? Why subject yourself to that? So at the time, like, obviously, you always want to have a lot of hope in your, your work. So at the time, I was really like, confident in the film, I guess. Looking back now, I would say it was uh, kind of a mess. Well, mostly a mess. But uh, I don't know. I still like it. I think it might just be a nostalgic value that um, makes me think that. But You don't feel embarrassed when you see the movie? No. I, I generally don't feel embarrassed by anything I do. So, But the cringiest part was still yet to come. Because the beauty of the 48 hour film contest is that all the contestants come together to watch the films in an actual movie theater. This horrible embarrassing garbage you just watched played on the silver screen to a sold out crowd and we had to sit there surrounded by people watching what we made. In a word, the experience was mortifying. What was your feeling in the theater watching the abomination we made in front of <laughs> hundreds of people? Well, um, as soon as it ended, the people behind us just immediately started talking trash. Like, what were these guys thinking? Why'd they waste money getting into this? And then uh, their film played next, and it was probably the worst thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I, I think we landed somewhere in the middle, because there's a, a lot of bad ones that year. You know, people uh, were laughing. Whether it was with the Serratus, I don't know, but they were laughing. So as long as people laugh, who cares? I'm gonna be honest. It was kind of like a dream come true, like because I've always wanted to be like on the big screen. And then I had a bunch of friends and family there, and watching other people in the group, other people's group video, ours was probably better and funnier. We got like the most crowd reaction, and then we had like no votes. And I'm just like. This is sad. Did you go to the, the showing when it was played in a theater? God, no. <laughs> <laughs> After all the films played, the directors got to stand up in front of the crowd and answer questions about their film. And I honestly couldn't tell you what I said. I completely blacked out. I don't know what questions people asked me, and I don't know how I answered. That entire memory is just a black hole in my mind. And that's probably for the best. I don't even remember if the girl from Craigslist went to the showing. After we submitted our film, I don't think any of us ever heard from her again. Which is a pity because as a 20 year old aspiring incel, I unfortunately had a huge crush on her. So here's the big question that everybody knows they need to ask. How obvious was it to both of you that I wanted to fuck that Mexican chick? Pretty obvious. <laughs> right when right when we met her, you were like, yeah. and you yeah. and I just look at each other and you're just like, yeah, I'm just like. So follow up question, <laughs> how obvious do you think it was to her? Probably not. Oh, she just no. She just seems so oblivious to everything. Oh, yeah. thank God, I was worried I was uh, <laughs> creating a whole cringe uh, memory for her to have. It's, it's a weirdo <laughs> and she's stuck in my house. The whole video is <laughs> a cringe-worthy experience for her. Oh man, I, I wonder what she would think of it if she saw it today. She probably locked those memories so far down inside of her body and she like, it would be like a Vietnam flashback if she saw <laughs> even a clip of the movie the again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would rather be in Vietnam than be in this fucking movie. Thinking back, like I just remember you being so stressed the whole day. <laughs> I guess I couldn't step away and think of that, so I don't know. I mean, now, now thinking back, maybe, I guess, because she was kind of flirty with you throughout the day. Well, oh, bullshit! She was! I'm I'm telling you, she was a fucking lesbian, dude. She did not fucking flirt with me. <laughs> she, she You're was, full of fucking she shit. She's definitely very talkative to you versus I the rest of us. I don't think so. But maybe it's just, uh, I don't know. That's just how I remember it. Mm, um, did you have any interactions or conversations with her at all? No, I don't think anyone did. I don't know what Biggs was talking about earlier about how she was flirting with you. That didn't happen yeah, at all. Yeah, I fucking knew it. Biggs, you lying piece of shit. <laughs> That's sort of You're I just remember. trying to convince me to message her now to embarrass myself. 
she seemed awkward and like we were gonna kill her the whole time. Anything to do with us? Just think back. Between him being stressed, she he was the only one that she ever talked to. At all. She slept in the same bed as our cousin. Yeah, that's, I remember her talking to her, the only other female there. I need males. Obviously, she talked to any males. Well, folks, that's the story of how I spent $150 to be forced into producing a horrible feminist film that was then played on the big screen for an audience of hundreds of people. One would imagine that after such a negative experience, we would have given up on participating in the 48-hour film contest, if not just giving up on filmmaking entirely. But. Much like how I failed with $5 in order to succeed with a person of culture, we decided to use this failure as a learning experience so that we could try to do better the following year. So, be sure to tune in next time to hear all about the final short film I've ever entered into a short film contest. Hey everybody, thank you for watching this video all the way to the end, and since you just sat through over 40 minutes of my bullshit, I want to give you all a special opportunity, because we are yet again, of course, doing a Monkey Jones short film festival, folks! That's right! The fourth ever! Summer 2019! And since you watched this video all the way to the end, you get to start earlier than everybody else. I'll post a video announcing the contest in a few days, but you guys right now, don't tell anybody. Shh, secret. Shh. So here are the uh, rules for the contest this time around. I want it to be a short film festival. And I really mean short. We're talking a time limit of two to five minutes. You know those short films I, I did in high school? They had a five minute limit. And I wanna see what you guys can do with the same restriction. So we're talking, you better get your storytelling, uh, <laughs> uh, just uh, chop out all the fat, give me that lean protein meat storytelling. Two to five minutes. Here are the required elements. Give us a character named either Nick or Nikki. And, uh, as you just saw, we had to do the line of dialogue in our film. How is that supposed to help? And, uh, we didn't do a great job incorporating that, so I want to see what all of you can do. So, in your two to five minute short film, you also have to include the line of dialogue. How is that supposed to help? And, uh, uh, I'm very much expecting to get nothing but films, uh, about cheating and pedophiles and stuff, so... I can't wait. <laughs> awesome, great. Uh, films are due on uh, August. Uh, films are due on August 18th, which is a Sunday. Uh, by the end of the day, that day. So you have, again, almost like a whole goddamn month. So get to work. You have a head start over everybody who was too lazy to watch this video to the end. Uh, more news about the contest will come out shortly, but. Get started! Go make some friends! Oh, and also, obviously, thank you to all the patrons who are still supporting me and giving me that cold, hard cash so I can, I guess, feed my cat. <laughs> okay, see you all next time. <laughs>